Hi, this is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and this is our podcast. Every week at New City, we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and learn how to make a difference. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires and challenges you to love God and serve your city more. If you want more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. Good morning, New City Church. We are excited that you are joining us for this series, You Good? Uh, And and listen, without attaching any bias, I just want to be honest and say that I believe that this phrase actually comes from New York City. It's where I'm from. And I realize this because of how deep, uh, how deep that phrase, you good, is in my vernacular. Like, I didn't realize how deep it was until I moved to the deep south and someone sent me this meme, okay? And so you see this meme, it's amazing. It shows one phrase, you good, and then it has eight different responses that could be attached to that phrase, you good. Like, are you okay? You are okay. How you been doing? All, all, all these different answers. And literally, I, I was dying hysterical when I saw that. In fact, in the moment that it happened, I became the joke of the moment. And all the Southerners were laughing at how many times I say it. But I remember one person in particular, they asked me, how am I supposed to know which one you're talking about? And we all chuckled and we laughed. But I think it's actually a really good question. You see, in, in order for us to ask a question, there needs to be context and clarity. I think it's super important for us to understand we need context and clarity. And I think the same is true of our emotions and our emotional and our mental health. There are so many stigmas that are placed on people who struggle with their mental health. But I think if we clarified it just a bit and brought some context and clarity, uh, we'd literally see that we have more in common than we don't. And so today, for the next few moments, I want to talk to you about the keys to being emotionally and mentally healthy. Let me read to you from the Psalms. It's an interesting psalm, Psalm 88. It's actually known as the saddest psalm in all of scripture. It was written by the sons of Korah. Listen to these words found in Psalm 88. It says this, uh, starting at verse one, Yahweh is the God who continually saves me. I weep before you night and day. Please bend down and listen to my sobbing for my life is riddled with troubles and death is just around the corner. Everyone sees my life ebbing out. They consider me hopeless, a hopeless case And they see me as a dead man. Skipping down to verse 10, it says, How can those who are cut off from your care even know that you are there? How can I rise up and praise you if I'm dead and gone? Pause in his presence. Verse 11 says, Who can give thanks for your love in the graveyard? Who preaches your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Does death's darkness declare your miracles? How can anyone who is in the grave where all is forgotten remember how you keep your promises. Verse 16, it says, I am overwhelmed by your burning anger. I've taken the worst you can give me and I'm speechless before you. I'm drowning beneath the waves of this sorrow, cut off with no one to help. And the last verse, verse 18, all my loved ones and friends keep far away from me, leaving me all alone with only darkness as my friend, literally known as the saddest psalm. And for the next few moments, I want to I want to unpack this psalm and help us to understand some things. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that we can find all types of emotions and all types of expressions in your word. We thank you that your word is not just a book of fairy tales, God, but it's a story of redemption. It's a story of reconciliation, God. And we thank you that in order to be reconciled, in order to be redeemed, Lord, we need to have these moments. So we thank you that we can find uh, solace in your word. Bless us and help us in your name. Amen. You know, Amy and I started a tradition not too long ago that whoever's birthday it is from our kids, we let them pick the cake from Whole Foods. So we literally pack the kids up, we go to Whole Foods, and uh, we let them choose whatever cake they want, okay? So it was Benjamin's birthday, my middle son. Uh, it was his birthday a couple of months ago, and we decided he can pick the cake. So we took him to Whole Foods, and he's looking at all the cakes in wonder, and he's super excited. And then he looked at one, and he began to pick it. I'll never forget, he looked at me and goes, Poppy, Poppy, I want this one. It's vanilla. And he started telling me how the cake was vanilla, but I actually read the label. And it was funny because the the label actually read as berry chantilly cake, but in his mind, it was a vanilla cake. And I love this. He actually loved the cake and it actually worked out. But in order for him to love the cake, he had to be willing to accept the layers. And, And sometimes I believe that we can look at something from the outside, but it can be so deeply layered within. And in order for us to dive into our topic today, I think there's some layers 
uh, we need to go through piece by piece. And, and there, may, there may be moments where I sound like Dr. Phil, and I know you may have come expecting Dr. Tony Evans. And so just track with me on this journey. I promise we're going to get to a good ending and we're going to see what God has to say about this topic. Uh, we have to look, in order for us to start this, and the first layer is really understanding the difference between mental health and mental illness. Because the truth is they're not the same. You see, everyone has mental health. But by definition, mental health is simply this. One's mental well-being, their emotions, their thoughts, their feelings, their ability to solve problems, uh, overcome difficulties, uh, our social connections, our understanding of the world around us. Whereas mental illness, by definition, is an illness that affects the way people think, feel, behave, or interact with others. There are many different types of mental illnesses with different symptoms. So in layman's terms, if I could say it to you this way, chemically, literally chemically speaking, not everyone is susceptible to schizophrenia or bipolar or clinical depression or clinical anxiety or clinical panic attacks. However, due to trauma, maybe poor health or other external circumstances, you know, they can have a poor effect on your mental health and give you temporary feelings of loneliness, depression, and even anxiety. Well, what does that mean for the church? You know, for a long time, the church has struggled with broken people. I can remember being a child and witnessing this, that the church has struggled with broken people, but the truth is, it's because the church is full of broken people. I'm reminded of what David writes in the Psalms 147. He says it like this. He says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. When we look at this, you know, the truth is, maybe it's not the church's job to do the healing of people. We've looked at the church to be able to do the job that was only assigned and designed for God to do. And as a result of those negative stigmas, there are people who struggle with poor mental health and what they do is they just sit in the pews and stay silent. In fact, I was one of them. I've been there before where my mental health due to different traumas and situations had left me feeling some type of way where I was confused and didn't know who I can share with. And the truth was, I felt more comfortable sharing what, what I was going through outside of the church than I did inside of the church. And here's why. There were some misconceptions that went on. I, I heard a ton of misconceptions. For example, uh, mental health is a sign of weakness. I heard that one before. I heard uh, you struggle with your mental health because you haven't surrendered fully to God. I, I've heard things like God is testing your faith. I've heard that this is a punishment because of sin. I've heard everything from you are a disappointment to God and a bad Christian because you struggle with mental health. Friends, when I think about this, the truth is I don't believe any of this to be true. We see enough in scripture to help us navigate ways for us to be emotionally and mentally healthy. But the keys that we get from scripture actually come from people who were struggling themselves. This is the truth, friends, that we see people who have struggled with their emotional and mental health, but we see that God has given us the keys to deal with it in his word. Let me give you some of the keys to being emotionally and mentally healthy. The first thing is simply this. You, you need to work on your communication and conflict resolution skills. Let me say it to you like this. If you're married, you know this to be true already, but conflict is a part of life. In fact, I could think of the person who is in a rush at the grocery store and they are on the express line and they have four items and right in front of them, uh, it's supposed to be 15 items or less and someone has 23 items. And you know this because you've been counting. You have to deal with conflict. Or maybe you're driving and you're in a rush to get somewhere and all of a sudden someone cuts you off. You have a moment where you have to deal with conflict. Maybe you're in school or even at your workplace, you've dealt with bullying before. The truth is you all, we all need to deal with conflict resolution and communication in a healthy way. I love what Paul writes in, the, in Romans. He says this in Romans 12. If it is possible, as, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. The truth is ignoring conflict is not a resolution either. Uh, I'm not asking you to stuff it in and stuff it up because when you don't ignore conflict, it becomes bigger. In fact, one of my mentors once told me, whatever you don't confront, you will confront. You actually need to have the healthy and, appro and the appropriate actions to deal with communication and conflict resolution. Don't ignore conflict. In fact, interrogate it. Ask questions, poke holes, and work on your conflict and communication skills. Let me give you a, another way to be emotionally and mentally healthy. You have to heal from your past. You know, I realized this uh, as I've, I've grown up, the older I've gotten, that you can't get healing on something you're hiding. It's, it's, it's literally impossible to heal from something you're hiding. 
And the most amazing families, I realize this because I've spoken to people who feel like because they've grown up in great families that everything is great in their lives. But the truth is this, whether you've grown up in a, a, a typical nuclear family, whether you grow up in a single family home or, or, or you're an orphan, no matter what you've gone through, the most amazing families have dysfunctions. We, we literally see this in the Bible with generational patterns. I think of Abraham who says that his wife is his sister two times. He lies about that. Then Isaac, his son, ends up saying that his wife is his sister. Then to make matters worse, Jacob, who is Isaac's son, tells his dad that he is his brother. Deception was all interwoven in the generational patterns that we see here. And this is what proves to us that we need healing from our past. When Amy and I relocated with our family from New York City to Louisiana, we literally went from being on a treadmill to being on a track. We went from, from the high pace of, of life where everything is happening so fast and you don't even have time to think about what's happening around you to a so, slow pace of life where you chose the pace that, in which you walked through. And what I realized during that time was that both Amy and I, we realized that we struggled with things from our past that we never dealt with from times when we were little kids. And I, I, it reminds me of what Paul says to the Corinthians. He says that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation, right? The new has come and the old has gone. And the truth of the matter is simply this. When I think about that scripture, there's so many Christians who are unable to walk in the new that God has for them simply because they're stuck in the old and they haven't gotten healing from their past. Getting healing from your past is huge to your emotional and your mental well-being. I, I recommend some things to do to get past your past is simply go to therapy. I'm in therapy every single week to deal with the hurts and habits and hang-ups of things that I dealt with when I was younger. Uh, maybe you need to get connected with a mentor here in our church or a church and be discipled. We have so many amazing people. And let me say this, a mentor is not always someone who is significantly older than you. Someone who is a couple of steps ahead of you can walk you through and you can process with them to get healing. Another way that I love is community. Uh, when Amy and I went to Louisiana, the process for us that started our past healings literally came with us being in a freedom group. We got into a small group and God began to work things inside of us that we buried so deep, we didn't even realize they were there. And we began to work with those things and we found freedom. I want to encourage you even now. Maybe you've been hearing us announce small groups and you say to yourself, well, it's too late for me. In fact, it is not. I want you to be super impulsive right now and literally go on your phone, go on your computer, sign up for a small group. You find healing, you find freedom in the context of small groups. I think about what happens in John chapter 11 when, when literally Lazarus comes back from the dead. Jesus calls Lazarus out of the grave and then he sends Lazarus to his friends to get unwrapped. Friends, a lot of us are walking around saved, but we're walking around wrapped up and bound up by our past. The way to get unwrapped, go to therapy, find a mentor, and get plugged into community. Let me give you the third key to getting emotionally and mentally healthy. It's simply this. You need physical health. Food, sleep, exercise, all those things are imperative for us to live a godly life. You know, in Corinthians, Paul says this in Corinthians 6. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. I've read many studies. Uh, I, the one I read most recently was actually from the Harvard Health Publishing, and it talked about the connection between sleeping poor, eating poor, and not exercising, and depression, anxiety, and ADHD. All those things are heightened, and they're exacerbated with poor sleeping habits and poor eating habits. I remember sharing this with Pastor Steve as we went to breakfast one day, but I remember going to the doctor not too long ago to get a routine physical. And you know, it was in the midst of our transition, and we, we found out some things about our son that was challenging for us, and we, we had to navigate that, and, and we were dealing with relocating from one state to another state. We were dealing with all types of hurdles. And you know, it becomes really easy when you're on the move like that, and you're dealing with trans transitions to just begin to eat and do whatever you want. And that's what happened to me, I was eating, poorly. I was sleeping poorly. Uh, and I was, I was trying to keep some rhythms, but it was really hard for me. And I went for a physical and spoke to the doctors about the, some of the things I was feeling. And literally, I, to my shock, to my, like, I was completely blown away. In that moment, the doctor had recommended me to get on antidepressants. Now, here's the thing. I'm all for doctors. I have many friends who are doctors. I think it's amazing. But I, I was shocked that I had gotten so low that I needed this, mo this moment of getting medication. I was like, oh my goodness, like what's, ha like, what's happening? And the doctor said, hey, before you try it, I want you to try something. I want you to try eating better, losing some weight, and see if seeing what happens. 
Well, you know, it was funny. I literally said, okay, from this moment on, I'm going to get healthier physically. I'm going to be more conscientious of what I'm letting into my body. I'm going to sleep more. I'm going to have healthier relationships. I'm going to have less screen time on my phone. I'm going to get off social media. I began to do these little things. And, and honestly, the truth of the matter is I began to felt, feel better emotionally and mentally as I began to change those patterns. Friends, I want to encourage you today. Use the New Year's as an opportunity for you to get healthy emotionally and spiritually, and oftentimes it is connected to your physical health. Let me give you the fourth and final key that we see here in terms of processing your emotions. And in order to do that, we have to actually go back to the text. When you look at this, let me give it to you. It's processing your emotions. That's the fourth way. You have to process your emotions. Let me give you some ways you can do that. The first way you can do that is by expressing your concerns. I love what the psalmist says here in verse 2 and 3. He says, please bend down and listen, listen to my sobbing, for my life is riddled with troubles and death is just around the corner. Everyone sees my life ebbing out. They consider me a hopeless case and see me as a dead man. I love when my kids, I ask them to clean up their room and, and, and I'll, you know, I'll see that they'll start pushing things around and what ends up happening is they'll make a corner or they'll put a little corner where they're putting stuff in and eventually that thing builds up and builds up and builds up and they have a bigger mess that they have to clean simply because they didn't handle something in the beginning. Friends, I want to encourage you that oftentimes we tend to process our emotions by bottling it up. We put a cap on it, we squeeze it tight, and then next thing you know, it takes any little situation to, have, to really get us to explode. Friends, the truth is simply this. You have to express your concerns. That's how you process your emotions. The psalmist, I love it. It's some hard words, but he literally is crying out and saying, listen to me as I'm sobbing. I'm, I'm riddled with troubles. He is expressing all that is happening to him. The, the second way you can process your emotions in a healthy way is sim simply to seek clarity. I love what verse 10 says. It says it like this. How can those who are cut off from your care even know that you are there? How can I rise up and praise you if I'm dead and gone? Pause in his presence. Who can give thanks for your love in the graveyard? Who preaches your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Does death and darkness declare your miracles? How can anyone who is in the grave where all is forgotten remember how you keep your promises? When I think about this, it reminds me of my time of being a teacher. You see, when I was a teacher, I would prepare students as much as I possibly could to, 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 to be ready for a test. That's what you do as a teacher. You help students prepare to be uh, tested. And I remember I would give my students all the tools they needed when I was a teacher. Okay, you, this is the subject. This is the topic. This is what you're going to do. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. But I would always tell them, when you're about to go through a test, listen, you can yell, scream, and shout, but I won't be able to answer your questions during the test. It's all on you. And they would be like, yeah, no, we got it, Mr. Ramos. No problem. We got it. It's going to be great. And literally, I would pass out all the tests, and within three minutes of me getting to my desk and watching the students, I would see hands begin to shoot up and literally begin to ask questions. And they're looking around, and they're upset because I'm not responding. I, I know this to be true, that some of you may feel that same way. Maybe you joined us for worship, and, and as Pastor Steve was singing, uh, Christ in Christ alone, you were lifting your hands, and you were God, like, God, I'm going through all these things, and I'm, I'm lifting my hands, I'm, I'm seeking after you, but I don't hear a response. Can I encourage you that silence from God doesn't equate his absence? Just because he's silent doesn't mean that he's not listening. You need to ask the tough questions. Still bring them to God even if you're not getting a response. I love the, the story of Job where Job is bringing complaint after complaint going, God, what is happening to me? And for 37 chapters, God says absolutely nothing. It is very possible that God is uh, in the midst of what's happening. I believe that he is in the midst of what's happening with you emotionally and mentally. But friends, I also believe with all my heart that sometimes God stays silent just to let you know that his presence is there. Friends, you have to be able to clarify what is happening with you. Let me give you another, uh, another thing that we see from the text. The, la the, the, the last thing we see from the text here is you need to be able to identify your emotions. This is, Psalm 88 is so heavy to me. And when you read the last three verses, it says some really heavy things. It says, I'm overwhelmed by your burning anger. I've taken the worst you can give me. I am speechless before you. I I'm drowning beneath the waves of this sorrow, cut off with no one to help me. Verse 18 rocks my world every single time. All my loved ones and friends keep far away from me, leaving me alone with darkness as my friend. When we read this entire psalm, all 18 verses, we literally see nine 
nine feelings or nine emotions that the psalmist shares. He shares the feeling of being abandoned, the, the feeling of feeling poor, humiliated, broken, helpless, hopeless, speechless, angry, lonely. And maybe you felt like that today. Maybe there are things going on in your life that you began to feel this pressure of, I don't know what's happening. You know, I, again, I, I can think through every janitor or every uh, custodial engineer that I've known, every superintendent of an apartment building I've lived in, and every single one that I can remember has this massive set of keys, right? Like literally they would have these loud keys. They probably don't use 85% of them, but they have the keys on their keychain. And, and, and it's cool because they have the keys, but I remember when I was a teacher, you know, the, 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 the custodian would have this one key called a master key. And literally, like, that one key had the ability to open every door up. It had the ability to open every door inside of a school building. And I believe I just gave you some amazing keys to, to being able to help you emotionally and mentally. But I want to give you the master key. Because the master key to helping you emotionally and mentally be healthy is simply this. You have to know where to direct your concerns. Where do we direct our concerns? Where do we bring our emotions? How do we grow in communication? How do we heal from our past? How do we deal with our eating habits and our bad patterns of not exercising? How do we deal with all that? It's literally found in Psalm 88, verse 1. It starts off by saying this, Yahweh is the God who continually saves me. Friends, I think it's important for us to understand and realize where to direct our concerns. We're going to get ready to land the plane here. I'm going to ask the worship team if they can get ready to come up I love that the psalmist writes these words. He says these words, Yahweh is the God who continually saves me. When I think about this, I'm reminded of Exodus chapter 3. And Exodus chapter 3 literally is a conversation between Moses and on the outside is just a burning bush, a bush that is consumed with fire. But when we read the story of Exodus 3, we see a conversation between God and Moses. And literally as Moses is bringing his concerns, his questions, he's processing his emotions, he literally asks God, okay, if I do what you ask me to do, who do I say sent, like who, who, who am I to say sent me? What do I tell them? This is, I'm talking to a bush. Who, who should I tell them that you are? And God replies with Yahweh, which translated in our Bible literally means I am. He says, I am that I am, I am. When I think about God's words to Moses in that moment, it reminds me that God is almost giving us like a blank check, literally a blank check, that no matter what you're going through, God can be that for you. The thing that you need most, God can be it. So what's happening today? Do you need love? Do you need joy? Do you lack peace? Are you dealing with anxiety and stress and depression? Do you need patience? Do you need kindness, goodness? Do you need gentleness? Do you need faithfulness or self-control? Friends, can I encourage you today that the truth is God can be exactly what you need. But oftentimes, if we're honest, we don't realize the thing that we need most. You know, a couple of, a couple of days ago, I was working out and I got home and, uh, and I began to feel this real serious pain in my elbow. It was like, it was super uncomfortable. It happened later on after the workout. So like, literally I went on WebMD, like I'm trying to figure it all out. I got on YouTube. I found a physical therapist who began to talk about different types of pains and elbows. One of them is called the tennis elbow. The other one is called uh, the golfer's elbow. And I, I began to resonate with everything that he said about tennis elbow. So I'm looking it up and he's, and I'm thinking, okay, tell me what I need to do. How do I stretch my elbow? Okay. I don't even know, like, how do I, like, I'm not really, I don't know what to do. And it was amazing that he literally said these words that oftentimes the pains that we feel in our elbow don't come from our elbow. It's coming from our wrists. It's coming from our shoulders, coming from a move, a bicep movement. And I love that because I would have tried to work out something here in my elbow area, but that wasn't the problem. The thing that I really needed was wristbands. The things that I really needed was to, was to put attention to my wrist. The things that we need, we don't realize we need. And it reminds me of a story that I heard one time of a, a, a father in Spain, a Spanish father who decided to reconcile with his son who had run away to Madrid. The father, in a moment of like remorse, he felt so bad, took out an ad in the newspaper, the El Libro, and he literally says these words, Paco, I have a question. Can you meet me tomorrow at the Hotel Montana at noon uh, on Tuesday? Can you meet me there tomorrow? All is forgiven, Papa. And when the father arrived at the square in hopes, to meeting, uh, in hopes of meeting with his son, he found 800 other Pacos 
waiting to be reunited with their father. We don't realize what we need the most. And friends, you may be thinking that what you're facing emotionally and mentally is a byproduct of your job. You may feel like it's a byproduct of all the circumstances around you, the relationships, all the things that are not happening, your finances. But when I think about it truthfully, I believe that what we really need is reconciliation with the Father is the thing that we need the most. And that reconciliation is called being born again. It's called being born again. It's beginning a relationship with Jesus. And being born again is as easy as A, B, C. A, you have to admit that you are a sinner. Paul writes in Romans, there is no one good, no, not one. You have to admit that you've made some mistakes. B, you have to believe, Jesus says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And C, you have to confess. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, you will be saved. If you're watching this, you may have felt betrayed maybe by the church. Maybe you felt betrayed by people in your family who haven't known how to process your mental or your emotional health. Friends, can I encourage you today? There's someone who knows exactly what you need, and his name is Jesus. If you've not, be, if you've not begun a relationship with him, I want to give you an opportunity now to pray a simple prayer with me that's going to help you jumpstart your relationship. Come on, won't you pray this prayer with me? Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my guilt, my sin, and my shame, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to. And you rose again to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you pray that prayer, we believe that you're starting a born-again relationship with Jesus.